Hi, everybody. My name is Ryan Lankloss here at Esri. I lead Public Safety Solutions, and I'm joined today by John Gogazian from GeoSpark Analytics, one of our partners that helps us deliver safety and security solutions across multiple sectors, including the public sector and government and private sector as well. I'm excited to have this conversation with John to learn a little bit more about what they do with ArcGIS Platform and Esri in general. So John, welcome. Um, it's nice to, uh, to see you and thanks for joining us. Maybe to start telling us a little bit about GeoSpark Analytics uh, and your work around risk. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, and thanks for having, having us here today. Um, so GeoSpark Analytics, as a company, we're about four years old. We actually started as a research and development program inside of a larger company and spun out. Um, what we do in general, as you said, is global threat and risk assessments through the application of really publicly available information. You know, actually, it's huge, 6.8 million unique sources of data that we, we curate you know, from, from news and social media, from economics, from natural disaster information, both long-term and short-term things. So, you know, everything from breaking news to things like from uh, institutions around the world, like the World Bank. And it's what we do with it that's a unique thing, right? We make all that information available in, in near real time, but it's the algorithms that we put on top that have really have, have really differentiated us and, and really drove in the utility of what we do in our platform and through our partnership with with Esri into uh, into our GIS platform, you know we we built analytic models around the data that do things like activity modeling, so we understand what's normal levels of information, uh, uh, you know, happening around the world and identify anomalies and those anomalies and we look for things that could be disruptive from a risk standpoint, you know, to corporations, to governments, to to, to you know public and private sector uh, um, users. Then we add additional layer on top of that where we built algorithms that take all that data into account and not just tell you where there's unusual ha events happening or things that could impose risk, but we tell you how those things are affecting the local, from the local to the country level stability of that location. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a geopolitical, social and economic stability assessment that our algorithms create that not only tell you what's happening right now, but tell you what it, how is it affecting that location? And then actually a forecast of the future. So we do a future forecast of the next seven days for every about 1,200 cities in the world, um, every country in the world, and about 8,000 regions so that you know, our users can understand the uh, you know, potential impact of those activities on their, on their operations, on their people, you know, both from a safety and security standpoint. Yeah, it's great, John. I appreciate the, what you said about, you know, there's so much information coming at us and it's like identifying the anomalies, like when should I pay attention? When do I know something's emerging so I can dig deeper in that? And you talked about it, just a number of data sets and the magnitude of data that you're ingesting into your, your system. And so I'd imagine that you have to rely on artificial intelligence and AI to support your customers more. Maybe you could speak a little about that. You talked some about algorithms you develop, but maybe just generally, could you speak a bit more about how you're using AI to support your customers? Yeah, that's great. So we, um, absolutely. And, and the, we don't have people in the process outside of our developers and our data scientists, right? And, and we do have analysts who help with understanding how these things could, you know, should affect, but we are 100% uh, machine driven uh, in, in the work that we do. So it's really a combination of some statistics um, and artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence side is primarily deep learning models. So we have natural language, we use a lot of natural language processing as you would guess, like when we ingest you know, news and social and economic data, um, you know, our, our algorithms read through the information, translate the information. We do entity extraction from that information as well. And then those algorithms, the combination of the statistical and the deep learning algorithms do things like categorize the information into what we call event classes. So things like that could be disruptive. So like different natural disasters, man-made disasters, um, uh, things like uh, uh, civil unrest, things like conflict, things like terrorism. Um, things like disasters. Um, and those, you know, those event classes, as we call them, are available as Azure feature services out of our AI engine. Um, and then, you know, the, the, then the real complex statistical and, and AI algorithms are the ones that do that risk modeling, as I mentioned. So we take all those different events, if you will, you know, the different type of things that are happening across the world. We built algorithms that, again, um, uh, say what the impact is. So what is the impact of a, a terrorism event in somewhere that is, um, you know, potentially apt to those as opposed to somewhere that isn't. And the, the, the system has learned over the course of the last four years that we've been running this, the areas of the world that are um, more risky and less risky. But every 15 minutes, those algorithms are reading the data 
reading the news, reading the socials, seeing what the long-term indicators are coming into that area and telling you really what the delta is. So we've built kind of a, our algorithms have built kind of a baseline and then again, are looking at what the changes to those things, again, to give that warning, that risk warning. And then again, all that information runs through our AI engine into our core platform, you know, our core Hyperion platform, and then also is available to the GIS community as as feature layers through through our GIS platform. That's amazing. So I mean, if I had to characterize what you do, it's like a real-time pulse of the planet and what's happening in terms of risk and threats that are emerging in places that we may not be able to see directly, but have a geographic context, right? And so I can imagine that obviously maps play a major role in that, right? Being able to, to position those, those alerts, those notifications in the space of geography. So I'm curious, like how do maps uh, and really ArcGIS platform from a development standpoint, help your customers put context around those risk assessments, start to explore that in deeper context around it. So maybe just speak a bit about maps and ArcGIS platform and how you're bringing that to your customers. That's great. And, and Ryan, you use the word, you know, we develop a pulse of the world. And, and um, uh, that, that's a great way to describe it, because actually, that's what we call it. You know, our risk models are actually ah, called perfect. pulse in our system. Great minds um, think alike. And then, exactly. Um, and, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, you were, we're about a four-year-old company. And the founders, the uh, you know, founding team of the company is about eight of us. Um, we all come from a geo background, right? We all come from some type of geo, geospatial background. So we think that way. We think in the sense of everything has a place. And the, the things that happen in that place affect that place. So maps and geography were key to us starting. Um, you know, what, as I mentioned, one of the things that we do is we pull all the information together and we do entity extraction, name locations, and geocode everything. So we try to drive down what's happening again in a city, in a region, in a country. So maps were number one thing we, we thought about going in as we started to build out this this technology because we're mapping things that normally aren't mapped sometimes. Um, so the way that we um, you know display and communicate our information. Is both tech is both spatial and non-spatial, right? We do things like we have algorithms that write risk reports automatically, but they write those risk reports about a place. And how do they understand where that place is, that city or that country, is because we 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 do a lay down of the raw information that we gather. Again, geo geocode all of it. And then our algorithms that we talked about earlier, those activity models and those stability models are all based on that location and things that are happening in that location. Um, so, and then the communication through our platform and the communication through <clears throat> uh, of the information as, as Esri feature services as well is all based on location. So if you're interested in um, you know, a certain country around the world or down to a certain city, you know, you can just focus in on that area or you can look at risk as a, as a ubiquitous thing across the entire, entire world. And often a lot of our clients have very focused areas, but more likely than not, they're, they're more focused on, they have vast operations and whether it's a multinational commercial organization company that has people and traveling around the world, operations around the world, they want to understand what their complete risk footprint is. And it's a spatial problem. Or, you know, is it something from, you know, one of our larger government, you know, clients that really is, you know, focused on, you know, US interest around the world. So it all it all comes down to place, right? I mean, it all comes down to the risk that you have around a location or a, or a facility or again, across the entire world. That's great, John. I appreciate that. I can imagine like in my mind, the scenario is playing out of like different customers of different types, like you mentioned, multinational organizations and even like, you know, organizations with global interests, if you want to think of it that way, being able to literally get a sense of what's happening for their infrastructure, their people, what might be affecting operations, like disrupting potential operations. So I just see tremendous value in what you do. Um, and so I'm curious, you mentioned your platform is Hyperion. And I'm wondering, so how are just platform enables you to reach those different customers uh, more than what you could do maybe through Hyperion alone. So talk about a little about the connection between these two and how that helps you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. And, that, and that's the whole reason why we, you know, developed the partnership with Esri in the first place. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, identified our, in our Hyperion platform and we use, we use um, the ArcGIS platform and maps in our platform to communicate the information, you know, the, the, the drive information. But we knew it wasn't enough um, because we knew that, um, as we started marketing out our platform, really, we, we were, were going to organizations and, and, and we knew they were going to have, and many of them did, were already um, uh, ArcGIS um, users and Esri clients. 
So it was a natural evolution of what we did. And, and, and from a development standpoint, from a maturation of our company to say, this is the partnership that we really want and to communicate that information so that, you know, we, our AI engine, as I mentioned, runs all these algorithms and, you know, ingest all the data, run all the algorithms. And then as we move that through our, our API, we convert those, you know, directly from our API into, into Azure Future Services and provide those out nice. into things from MarkGS Online to Arc Enterprise so that organizations around the world can bring those right into their environments and integrate that information into the information they already have, you know, so that it, so it takes, and, and a number of our clients, especially some of our larger public sector clients, will use both our platform and the Esri services integrated into their larger environment so that they have kind of the view of what we do from a pure sense. And then they are able to take that information and integrate that in with the other information that they have in their environment as well. So it's kind of this, this, this undeniable one, two punch for risk. I like that. I think it's putting that risk in the context of their own data, right? Their own infrastructure information and just providing that deeper insight. That's what GIS is all about, right? Layering this together. So the fact you can provide value and risk on top of their own data and combining that through ArcGIS and Aperion is tremendous. So I, I think when I first got to see that in play, it was around COVID-19 during the pandemic that we're experiencing. I mean, with some of the work you're doing with various governments and different customers that we have together. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that to give people a sense of how you've been supporting this uh, actually with the pandemic around us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we had been talking with some um, folks like FEMA before the pandemic. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we have uh, the RAI engine and we produce a specific type of risk model. Again, it's kind of a, you know, that geopolitical risk model. Um, and we started talking with a number of organizations, including FEMA, about can we take that model and, lack of a better word, tune it, right? You know, put instead of doing a geopolitical risk, can we take that same engine that we have and look at other risks? Um, and actually, we're talking with a, with a few uh, organizations about different types of risk. And then Obviously, when, when COVID hit, there's a lot of you know, focus on, on how can we use artificial intelligence to help with that. So we pretty quickly, uh, actually about this time last year, uh, spun up an effort to take our, uh, our engine um, and again, tune it, you know, really to look initially at the United States and at, at a county by county level, uh, looking at the risk of COVID in those areas, but different, different than what the tremendous work that places like John Hopkins is doing and the tremendous work that like University of Washington is doing. We actually, we actually built a, a, a model that took into account things like the uh, uh, current infection rates and, and, and the, you know, epidemiological spread, things like social distancing factors and, and about actually about 3000 different uh, data factors. And what we ended up developing was a risk model that looked at every county in the country, but a risk not just of the spread of the pandemic, but the risk of the potential impact to the underlying hospital systems and the medical yeah. medical systems. Yeah. So, you know, what we wanted to work with these these groups on was not just where the where the uh, pandemic was spreading, but even though there was a spike in cases, was the underlying medical facilities able to handle that spike or not? Yeah. So that there could be resource allocations in those areas that would be would be uh, more impacted by that, um, you know, it, it took off like you know it really took off. Um, so it started. It was used. It still is being used by groups like FEMA, like HHS, uh, the White House Science Office of Science and Technology Protocol, by you know, U.S. Northern Command. Um, we have a number of our you know commercial clients who who have been using it as well. We've done some other things to the side as well. I mentioned those things like those hotspot models we create. Yeah. So we've done the like a hotspot model for COVID around the globe, different than an outbreak model, but something like there's increased levels of information around uh, around um, things like in news and social media around COVID, which ironically, as we looked at, kind of correlated with where there were spikes in um, infection rates as well. So there's been there's been a lot of work. We're not we're not a health company. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not, that's not our core process, but it's, it's, it's a piece of, as we think of risk as well. That's yeah, great. I think for, for many of those probably listening for us, I know it's like, we, we feel like we're much closer to epidemiology than we've ever been before. Right. And, and knowing that, but, you know, I think, um, you, you kind of describe, I think one thing that's really interesting in the work that I saw that you did in COVID, which was this, you know, combining like the news media and things that are out there, like these leading indicators that something may be developing, right. In combination with the data that's telling us that there's actually, you know, cases rising, you mentioned 3000 different variables. So 
again, it's all about, you know, bringing that together in the context of location that helps people make decisions over you know, resources to hospitals. I, I really appreciate the story you just told. And so maybe just to, to can I come back for a second to ArcGIS platform, could you talk about how that helped you deliver that capability to those customers again and help them ingest that and make a difference? Yeah, so we, we purposely, um, uh, the, the, when we first started this, it was 48 hours to put the first one out and to get it out that fast so it could be used, yeah. um, we, we designed it around ArcGIS platform. Um, we did not actually put it into our core uh, uh, Hyperion platform. Um, it, you know, initially that that risk model. It was a number of different things. Um, you know, the ArcGIS platform allowed us the flexibility to get it out really quickly, uh, but it also allowed for uh, rapid adoption of it. Um, you know, a number of the organizations who were interested in this, you know, were not our clients from a Hyperion standpoint but they were ArcGIS users and they were doing a lot of this work in ArcGIS. So it was, a, it was an easy decision uh, to say, let's put it out as, you know, in, in, as ArcGIS feature services and, and integrate it directly as quickly as we could into those organizations. Um, and actually we, we um, there was one model that we did, we call it our, 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 you know, more or less our COVID information model that actually released to the entire public that was just, here's here's all the information we're gathering on this and just open that up to yeah. anybody who wanted it. And then the risk model is on top of that. So it was, a, it was an easy decision to go that way because we knew there had to be, we had to get this out quickly. We had to get it into the hands of the, of the responders. Um, and literally in 48 hours, we had it up running and in, the, in those hands of those organizations. That's awesome. Well, John, thanks for joining us today. And I want to say thanks for the partnership at Geospark Analytics and the amazing work, not just for COVID-19, but what you're doing to, to get risk in the hands of decision makers and, and the great work using Esri and the technology of ArcGIS platform. So thanks for joining us, John. I appreciate it. It's nice to, to see you. Thanks again, Ryan.